interesting discussion. Got it. Thanks, Doreen. Yeah. Um, can we can we have other people be muted? Well, let me just do this. Hey, now we just know. Yeah. Okay, here we are, seven o'clock. Um, I am one of the co-leaders of the book group that we started, and we started it just a little bit over a year ago. We started it um, one year minus one week, and we uh, did it, we started with Corporations Are Not People, and we did it on the anniversary of the Citizens United Supreme Court decision. Um, so tonight, we're actually on our sixth book, and Nancy, I think you'll find it's eerily timely for us to be with you tonight. Um, so just a few little mechanical things as, as Olivia was just saying, Olivia will be talking in a minute because she's our executive director for Open Democracy. Um, just keep introducing yourselves to each other in the chat. We're recording the Zoom so that we'll be able to, you know, do something with it later on. We'll save the chat. Um, and you know, use the chat throughout the evening for your questions and comments. Um, okay, so we're gonna keep admitting people, uh, but I am gonna let Olivia start um, so that we keep on our, our schedule. So we'll, we'll have some talk with Olivia and Nancy, then we'll have breakout rooms, then we'll come back together. And throughout the evening, we can't wait to hear what your ideas are and engage in sort of a conversation. So again, let's just stay muted to reduce background noise unless you're actually speaking, okay? So Olivia, will you take it away? Yes, thank you all so much for coming. Some of you I know have been to Six Book Club and some tonight is your first night to our Democracy Book Club. It's hosted by Open Democracy. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit based in New Hampshire, um, founded by Granny D who walked across the country for campaign finance reform many years ago. And I am, it's such an honor to have the author of our book here tonight. Um, Nancy McLean is a professor at Duke University. Um, she's an American historian and her research um, on gender, labor, history and movements is um, remarkable. And she is a, just a remarkable author and thinker. And, um, and I hope she will tonight inspire us to not just learn about what's happening to our democracy, but also take action. And the way we're gonna to structure today is that uh, for the first you know, 40 minutes or so of tonight's program, um, Nancy and I and others will have a conversation and then we'll break into breakout rooms so we can discuss the book. Um, and in your breakout rooms, we'll have some instructions on, on discussion questions. Um, but then we really want um, the breakout rooms to all come back together and report what are what is the one action you want to take um, to make things better. So um, just to remember at the end of the night to to report the actions you are going to take. Um, so Nancy, I'd like to get started uh, with the first question to you if if you're going to write the next chapter after hmm. January 6th, what would you say? Wow. Uh, well, first of all, let me just um, thank you, Olivia, for uh, organizing this. And what a great idea to have a democracy book club in these troubled times when we both need illumination and community. Um, so fantastic idea and really happy to be with you and delighted to see all the um, different places people are coming from. We really have just about every corner of the country represented here, uh, it seems, and, and many names that I know from you know people who have written and are on my mailing list for the book and stuff. So welcome uh, to all of those who are coming to this for the first time. Um, and I hope you'll stay with it. It'll be great to be in a conversation that connects people across states. So if I were updating it for January uh, 6th, wow. Um, I have to tell you that more than once, I have really wished that I had been wrong <laughs> in my, what I was writing about uh, in Democracy and Chains. And there were times when I was doing Doing the research and I was uncovering, you know, yet other dimensions of the breadth of all this, as some people would say, you know, the tentacles uh, of this coctopus. And it was just 
kind of breathtaking uh, and, and dispiriting, quite frankly, at times. Um, but really, uh, the Trump administration and then the events of January 6th, I see as a kind of sad confirmation of um, of of uh, uh, the developments described uh, in the book. Clearly, there have been, you know, there were some surprises. I don't mean to say, you know, it was all in the cards or anything like that. But um, but if you look at uh, what the House Select Committee has found uh, so far uh, in their preliminary findings about January 6th, it really speaks, I think, to some of the themes of the book. So um, they, uh, and I've heard uh, uh, Co Congressman jo uh, Jamie Raskin speak about this uh, a couple times now, but they are uh, identifying, uh, have identified what they call three circles of activity. And the first circle is the large number of MAGA true believers um, who came to uh, the Capitol in the believing in the big lie and wanting to support uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, campaign to, to reclaim uh, the presidency. Um, and then they identified a smaller group of white power actors Activists, the kinds who were just prosecuted uh, today. There were some headlines about this who came, you know, planning for armed conflict, you know, with weapons, with all kinds of uh, equipment for military style operations. But then um, what they're saying they believe the most dangerous circle is was the insiders, you know, essentially the folks in suits inside the White House and beyond who were working on what we can see now was actually a coup attempt. Um, political scientists actually refer to this kind of thing as a self coup because it's the uh, effort of a sitting uh, um, elected official to stay in power after an election has said it's time to go. Um, but we see that that effort, the, the more and more information that comes out, it wasn't just, you know, some of the uh, folks who are in the news a lot, who, you know, like the Rudy Giuliani's and others, but in fact, uh, involved this John Eastman, who was from the Federalist Society, head of their, um, uh, what do they call it, Federalism and State Practice Group, I believe, who came up with the, uh, the, the legal fig leaf, legal and constitutional fig leaf to support this. Um, it turns out that for years they were working on, uh, within the Federalist Society, there were some individuals working on what they call the independent state uh, legislature doctrine, um, going back to the 2000 uh, election and the Bush v. Gore uh, decision of the Supreme Court that would essentially allow state legislatures to overthrow an election to to get rid of the, the choice of the vast majority. So, I mean, I could go into more detail there, but basically what I would say about all three uh, circles in that um, uh, that developing bill of particulars from the House Select Committee is that all of them are the product of long cultivation by this radical corporate right uh, led by Charles Koch and funded by the donors that he has brought together. The fact that now three quarters of Republicans believe this big lie um, is very much a result of the creation of their effort to get rid of the fairness doctrine and broadcast in 1986 to open the airwaves to the likes of Rush Limbaugh um, and Fox News and Tucker Carlson and all the rest um, who have cultivated a loyal following who um, who believe the big lie. Um, and that, you know, helps us uh, understand that that first group the white nationalists um, are less, you know, connected to the the particulars of the case that I wrote about. But I think some of the the um, vehemently anti-government ideas and the idea that anyone who uh, looks to government for action is some sort of a parasite, in James Buchanan's language, you know, that certainly. Uh, illuminates that middle group to some degree. And then, as I say, that last circle, you know, clearly there were some people who were just loyal to Donald Trump, but the institutional structures that they were able to rely upon really do have their roots in the uh, Coke uh, integrated strategy that I described in Democracy in Chains. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. My next question is around citizen activism and how can citizen action counter the, the narrative that billionaires have put out 
um, to really strengthen our democracy. Yeah, well, I think there's both short term and long term uh, efforts we can do. I'm just realizing that with all the wonderful geographic representation on this list, I oh, nope, we do have someone from Sedona, Arizona. Um, uh, Right now, our biggest need is for folks in Arizona and West Virginia uh, to be working on uh, Senators Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin and making them understand um, that their constituents uh, believe that they must suspend the filibuster to pass democracy reform. We now have the opportunity of a generation with the uh, Freedom to Vote Act and the John uh, Lewis Voting Rights Restoration Act coming up. And so we should have, you know, I think it's really important for all eyes to be upon that, for people to be, you know, reaching out to their local media, their networks. There'll probably be calls for um, various kinds of um, uh, actions. Uh, related to that. So in the near term, I think we really need to keep the pressure on to make it possible for this administration to deliver on the structural democracy reforms that we uh, so desperately need. But I think it's also important that we um, clearly, our cause is completely different from the kind of right that I wrote about. Uh, but one thing that they did, or a few things they did that I think are important for progressives to think about are, first of all, taking ideas seriously. Um, and I think that you're doing that, all of you, by reading, by engaging in a book group like this, and perhaps other things that you're doing in your home uh, communities, but really thinking hard about, you know, if we want to see a better world, if we want to see a more inclusive, robust democracy, if we want to see racial equity, you know, if we want to uh, have action to stop the climate catastrophe, what is it that we actually have to do, <laughs> you know, ourselves uh, as citizens and through the organizations and networks we belong to to make that happen? So I think that kind of strategic thinking is very important. Uh, another thing that's that the right has done that I think um, the the uh, left, broadly speaking, could uh, benefit from uh, from doing is getting out of our silos. You know, we have so many, um, you know, we have organizations here who work on the environment, here who work on, you know, democracy reform, here who work on civil rights, here who work on reproductive rights. Um, and we need to have much more of a common conversation about what we all need in the way of democracy reform and a common vision um, to go forward. So I I think uh, that is another uh, element. Then I think um, along the lines of being strategic, we need to think about the kinds of uh, changes that will um, build in uh, momentum for the cause. And an example of that from a previous time is social security. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt felt very strongly that it was important. You know, some people say it's a regressive policy, but he also believed, and I think rightly so, that if Americans were all paying into social security, um, they would also feel like it was their program, you know, and, and that would be a strength going forward. Um, so I think we can consider uh, things like that. I think these democracy reforms would also be structural changes that would help us go forward uh, in a good way. Um, you know, many of the elements of the Build Back Better um, uh, plan would help people feel a real kind of um, investment in and benefit from democracy that would be helpful. So there are a number of things uh, that we can do, but those, those are some. So my next question, I was at the state capitol today, we're watching our election law hearing today, and um, there were lots of stop the steal voices um, encouraging us to pass legislation, which we clearly don't need because it's based on a premise of a lie that our elections were stolen. And so when we think about the work we have to do at our own state capitals, the work we have to do on campaign finance reform to get big money out of politics, the work we have to do on redistricting, um, what advice do you have for us um, in, in, as we move these arguments forward? 
Uh, yeah, well, I think um, your point, Olivia, about the other side being very active and very organized is hugely important. So if um, there are folks on this um, uh, Zoom who are not already involved with groups like yours or others that are working on these issues, I really hope that they will think about getting involved because we really need, you know, to borrow a phrase from the uh, student civil rights movement um, uh, of the 60s, more hands on the freedom plow. <laughs> if we're going to uh, get through this. And you raised a particularly important issue, I think, that goes, to, again, to that, the way the other side is thinking strategically, that they are trying now uh, within the states that they control to, um, to change the way elections are run and to change the way the votes are counted and taking nonpartisan professional election administration and turning it in to partisan um, controlled efforts based on this big lie. And so we're going to need people from all over to run for offices, you know, at the state and local level in election administration, to be volunteers on election day, to make sure, you know, that things are, are done right. So there's just a great deal that people can do. And I'm sure others who are on this call who are involved in the work like you uh, and folks from Open Democracy will talk about that perhaps more too when, when we get to the, the breakout groups. But those are some things that occur to me now. Yeah, thank you. And I've, I've spent many of election days as a poll worker. So something mm -hmm. I have done for the last five years just because uh, I am a democracy nerd. <laughs> um, so Liana, I think it's Liana asks, um, she's curious about your opinion of a Canadian um, professor's prediction that the United States would be right wing dictator by 2030. Um, aren't we already a corporate oligarchy? Uh, yeah, I saw that report uh, as well and, and actually want to look uh, further into it. And I think it's actually really important that um, leaders in the United States, including business leaders, uh, start to realize that other countries are looking at the United States in alarm now and saying, you know, what the hell is going on? You know, why are you allowing this? Um, and uh, so that's hugely important. Um, the corporate oligarchy uh, is real. I don't think it's complete, but it is absolutely, it's been demonstrated by political scientists that the Senate is all but impervious to the beliefs and interest and views and needs of the bottom 50% of the income uh, spectrum. Um, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island um, is a wonderful voice for uh, democracy reform and climate action. And he uh, wrote a book that came out uh, several years back called Capture, the Corporate infiltration of American democracy. And this is something that he's witnessed as a sitting US Senator uh, get worse over time. He's also has a project called Captured Courts that show how this Koch network um, and the groups they fund have been uh, steadily and stealthily uh, driving judicial appointments and bringing us the Supreme Court that today uh, ruled against the president in one of the key cases uh, involving COVID. So absolutely, um, we do face uh, a, a real crisis with the way that dark money in politics and corporate political spending and power, um, both over the electoral process and over the, the courts, um, the federal courts and the Supreme Court um, is skewing our, our system in a way that is uh, grossly over benefiting um, the wealthiest uh, and really the, you know, like the portion of the 1%, not even the, you know, the, the highest, you know, billionaire portion, um, grossly expanding their wealth and advantages while making it really hard for other Americans to get by. Um, but the only way we will get through that is if we put shoulder to the wheel um, and take advantage of this moment. And what is really a tremendous opportunity and how many people are thinking along the same lines who see the urgency of this moment, who see the opportunity and are ready to act. So, so that um, is very exciting. Uh, but there's also people, you know, starting to write realistically about uh, conditions that have produced civil wars in other countries and whether such conditions, you know, whether we're reaching such a danger point here. So I do think that this is a time when 
inaction for people who care, you know, about um, the country, about their grandchildren and children and the future, you know, about other people, it's not really an option not to be dis to be disengaged now. You know, there is so much happening, and um, if good people are not filling that vacuum, you know, really, really, really uh, frightening actors are are at the ready. Um, so we really need to take this all seriously. Yeah. So Amira asks, why do we need election financing in our democracy? Uh, well, that's an interesting way to reset, um, reset the case. Um, you know, certainly you need a certain amount of funding. You know, if you think of a candidate needs to travel, needs to get on the airwaves, needs to put out materials, etc. I think the question is about dark money, you know, and about, well, corporate money and, um, and also the dark money that was enabled mm -hmm. by Citizens United, which, and I think you might have said this in your opening remarks, but um, next week, I believe, is the anniversary of the Citizens United decision. And that has just been absolutely devastating and has enabled uh, so much of this capture. So, um, you know, one of the crucial things that we need is to stem that flow of particularly dark money, but also uh, corporate money in general that has so infiltrated uh, the political process. And, you know, there are places that have adopted public financing um, of elections, of local elections, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, some elements of, of state politics. And in fact, in um, the 2018 midterms, everywhere that democracy reform was on the ballot, those measures won. So there is clearly a public hunger for such things, um, and uh, and we need to make that happen. By the way, um, another book that might be of interest for your book group uh, going forward. Um, well, there's so many, <laughs> but um, but one of them actually is not the one I was going to say. But this one I think is so important because the political right is so uh, weaponizing uh, racism and parents' fears, you know, about schools and whipping up this whole business about you know. Um, panic about critical race theory, what they call critical race theory. Um, anyway, so a great book for that is The Sum of Us um, by Heather McGee. Um, and it says, I forget the exact subtitle, but it's basically about how racism hurts all of us. And she just makes a fantastic uh, case. She's a former head of Demos and is wonderful. It's very readable and very good. So that would be one thing. Um, but also there's a book by David Daly, who many of you might know from the book he wrote about the big 2010 gerrymander that was called well rat fucked <laughs> with two asterisks <laughs> um but uh because his publishers wouldn't let him say gerrymandering in the title apparently they thought it was too wonky but he has a, another book that came out after that called unrigged and that book talks about a number of um citizen-led campaigns to uh reclaim and restore democracy including the successful ballot initiative in michigan for independent nonpartisan redistricting that's really really was really inspiring um but a number of other cases. So, um, so that is a long-winded answer to the, the question, well, but there and are it's other resources and campaigns out there. Great, great on point because we had David Daly and we have read oh, good. that book prior in our, um, in our book club. So um, the next question is from Jamie um, and it sort of ties into the dark money that you were just discussing, but would you, would you, would you call, um, the question to revise the constitution, um, helpful or dangerous? Uh, well, the political right, and you know, particularly the the many in the Koch network and their donor network, is pushing hard for a constitutional convention for people who are new to this subject because it's kind of flying under the radar uh, in significant ways. Um, this would be the first constitutional convention since the constitution was uh, drafted in 70, 1787. Uh, so it is really an alarming, dangerous effort, and it depends how you count the authorizations they want. You know, if you look at older authorizations, they have 28 of the 34 needed to convene a constitutional convention. Um, more restricted versions uh, of the authorizations are being advocated by a group called the Convention of States. And if you look at their website, you will see how serious they are, how far along they are, and also 
how frightening they are if you see uh, some of the personnel. Um, so that would be devastating. Um, and that very much comes out of the James Buchanan, you know, stream of constitutional thought that I wrote about in Democracy in Chains, um, because it very much is an effort to shackle democracy. And in fact, one of the people <laughs> who is a leader in this effort, a man named Mark Meckler, um, said on a uh, uh, radio talk show that their goal is to reverse 115 years of progressivism. So that's how they're thinking about that. So that is really dangerous. That said, though, I think that we also need some constitutional amendments. <laughs> and um, there are some good people who, who uh, write about this. There's a team at the Brennan Center who wrote a book that came out last year called um, The People's Constitution. And they point out that in American history, it's very hard to amend the U.S. Constitution <laughs> as people working to, you know, end Citizens United may, may uh, be uh, very well aware. Um, and that means it doesn't happen all the time. Um, and those amendments tend to come in batches, like the three Reconstruction Amendments, 13th, 14th, 15th, the Progressive Era Amendments, the 60s Amendments, etc. Anyway, I think we do need a new batch of constitutional uh, amendments um, to address some of these issues that we're talking about. And they express confidence that that may, in fact, be uh, be coming upon us. But first, I think we do need to deal with this political right that would use uh, a constitutional convention to make it impossible, frankly, short of revolution for us to um, do the things that the vast majority want. So the next question is from Gordon. How about a progressive Powell memo to give us a common vision um, we need and how we get out of our silos? That is a really interesting idea. I really like that. I mean, I think there's lots of conversations actually going on on the progressive side, you know, among a, a wide range of organizations now, you know, ranging from labor unions, uh, some, you know, the more progressive labor unions to um, Greenpeace to um, uh, racial justice groups and, and women's groups, but uh, of realizing that we need such a thing um, and that um, that we need to change the conversation and the public debate <laughs> as well as unrig these rules. Um, I've not seen anything like that yet, but but I think that um, that that's a great idea, and that's that's you know certainly something that should come. I think there is some kind of like a declaration for democracy that a, a number of groups um, came up with. I don't have it at my fingertips, but. Um, uh, you know, and clearly we're going to need this coming from many, many different angles. Like, for example, if you think about um, all that happened in the New Deal, you know, the development of the CIO, you know, in a very progressive labor movement, the, the New Deal, you know, there were uh, struggles for racial justice that were really important in that period. And the groundwork was laid for that in thought and actually in uh, religious um, uh, circles as well um, in the earlier years of the 20th century, the 1910s, 19-teens, 1920s. So, uh, you know, I, there's actually an expression from uh, a civil rights group that in the 1950s um, they, they said it's never more important to keep the conversation going than when it seems to be going nowhere <laughs> right um, so so I think that's a maxim to keep in mind because all of these efforts you know if you don't give up they break through and I'll give you one more example uh, I'm reading now about um, uh, early American history and particularly about slavery and abolition you know in in the run-up to um, to the Civil War. And it's so interesting that the abolitionists, many abolitionists by the 1850s were just so frustrated. They were like, it's hopeless. This country will never change. It, and they were on the eve, you know, of the biggest revolution against slavery that created, you know, a revolutionary enfranchisement of the formerly enslaved. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we won't have anything that cataclysmic. I think we have tremendous resources on the progressive side now uh, that, that didn't um, exist then. Uh, and the, the constitution and the country are much different, but I, you know, the, the point of staying at it, even when it can seem frustrating, is really, really um, worthwhile to keep in mind, I believe. Great. So there's lots of questions coming in. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I see a hand up. Um, Tula, do you want to just unmute and ask your question? 
Thank you. Hi, Nancy. It's great to see you. Um, I'm really concerned. We met with our senator staff yesterday, and of all the things that people want in these great wish lists, and we only have seven months now, mm -hmm. um, it, the main thing is exactly what you said. We have to get the money out of politics, and we said, how can we get this? And they said it won't happen. Even if we have no filibuster, because the Democrats, many of the Democrats are owned by corporations as well as all of the Republicans. So they're not gonna vote to get the money out of politics. So we stand on the street corner weekly with signs by Boeing's headquarters, UPS, uh, AT&T to call attention to their donations to people who wanna overthrow our government and Whole Foods, we do that weekly. We meet with our senator staff. We have every week until the past year, we meet with them once a month. What more can, as activists can we do? We don't have time for this wish list to go on forever. What can we do more than we're doing? Yeah, um, so it sounds what, you're, what you are doing sounds so important. And I do agree with you that there is a danger and it's driven by the whole structure of progressive politics of you know reliance on grant funding from foundations that expect results on the particular issues that they funded. That as you say, you know, there are these siloed wish lists and everybody trying to elbow you know, everybody out of the way to get these other things. I do think there is a huge consensus on these two bills that are up now across different groups and different silos. So I think that's important and really, really coming down on that is crucial. But I love what you're doing in terms of corporate accountability. I think that is exactly the kind of thing that people need to understand. And I will say too, there are some very good um, journalists who are on this beat as well and, and outlets, um, uh, investigative outlets. So one of them is the Center for Media and Democracy. Uh, CMD that puts out something called PR Watch, and they have been among the best trackers of the Coke Network, of ALEC, and others. Uh, I'm actually on their uh, board now, full disclosure. Um, but there's also uh, Judd, um, I'm space, Legum, I think is his name, has a, um, a, a Substack feed, like some, I saw somebody mentioned Heather Cox Richardson, where exposing corporate donors, and uh, he and others have exposed that in you know of all I think it was like 147 companies that or something like that in the wake of uh, January 6 last year said oh we're not going to give to these these. Um, proponents of the big lie who tried to stop the certification of the election anymore. Well, fast forward, only six of them are now <laughs> still stop doing that. So the kind of work that you're doing, Tula, I think to expose that and to shame uh, the corporations, particularly those that are brand sensitive, you know, as you said, Whole Foods and others, like they do not need, you know, or AT&T depends on, on consumers. So I think that is really, really good work. And I think that's also work that helps um, uh, raise consciousness that we need for the long term uh, for the kinds of changes that you know uh, we all want to see. We feel that basically what we're doing is uh, teaching and letting mm -hmm. people know what's happening. We also incorporate it with the uh, Supreme Court getting rid of Roe, but mm -hmm. uh, we've got a president that uh, supports uh, fracking and fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So we, we're really in a bad position with money in both sides. And as they stressed, okay. it is not just cinema and mansion. Yes, it's no, I, I think that's really, really, really important uh, to stress. And I think, you know, Maybe. Bernie Sanders made that case in a way that was compelling to people on the red side of the divide as well as blue, because so many people, you know, feel like that. Like, come on, man, what's going on here? Um, so, yeah, so I don't have any easy, you know, I wish I had, you know, kind of the magic solution for that. I don't. Um, but I think the continuing uh, exposure of the damage done on so many things that people care about about by Citizens United and by this continued corporate funding in just the way that it sounds like you're doing uh, with going to Boeing. And actually there was um, uh, a report not very long ago that the, the worst big funders of the, the insurrection, um, pro-insurrection elected officials uh, were Boeing and Coke. Um, I think that was from CMD. Uh, so good that you're on top of uh, Boeing there in Seattle. And we're pushing everybody to read your book. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So Joan has a, a question actually, which I think is really fascinating about the privatization of our public schools. And I think when you set out to, when you wrote this book, you set out to sort of expose education. So can you talk a little bit more about the effort to under or privatize public schools and undermine our democracy? Yeah, hugely, that's a hugely important part of the story. I wanna go back just one second to uh, what Tula said about getting everybody to read my book, um, which I of course appreciate, but also I know that not everyone is a book reader um, and that people also feel urgency about some of the actions. So there's a great uh, article, it was kind of a review article uh, about the book by Lynn Paramore of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, but it's called Meet the Economist Behind the 1% or the Economist of the 1%. But anyway, I think that's a superb resource for anybody who wants kind of a shorter version of this and it's free it's online so just mentioning that um, if you know people who won't read a book but might benefit from the information um, as far as public education goes yeah you know as as those of you who have read the book know this is how I got into this story uh, was the attacks on public education in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education and actually some of the antipathy toward public uh, education went back to the 19th 30s. And ironically, very similar to what we see now with the parents who are complaining about their kids learning about racism in school <clears throat> and coming home and probably saying things like, why do we live in an all white neighborhood? How come we don't have any, you know, etc. But in the 1930s, um, a lot of uh, conservatives, like they didn't believe that people were supporting the New Deal um, and labor unions and such, and even some of their own children. And so the way that they explained that was to say that there were communists in the public schools, right, um, that were turning the public schools against them. So that that hatred of public education actually goes, you know, farther back in this movement conservatism, but it really got a shot in the arm from the segregationist uh, reaction to Brown versus Board of Education and how then the movement movement conservatives recruited the segregationist opponents of public schools who were trying to get private school vouchers. Um, and as you know, that effort has never stopped. Um, ironically, because of the levels of segregation in America, they had trouble um, getting you know, white suburban parents who might vote Republican to support privatization because they were very happy with their local tax supported, you know, extremely well-performing uh, public schools. So in the 1980s, um, they made a calculate effort on the right, particularly groups like the Heritage Foundation and so forth, to go after what they called non-traditional alliances, meaning to go after African-American and Latino uh, parents who were very dissatisfied with the state of their schools, given that metropolitan desegregation didn't work, schools were left unfunded, et cetera. So it's a complicated landscape uh, now. But the actors on the right are very determined. The Koch network has prioritized this and their new group stand together. They keep rebranding after every name gets polluted um, <coughs> after some years, uh, but they're pushing hard for this. And one of the things that we all need to be aware of is they are using the um, pandemic um, the crisis of the pandemic and now, um, you know, leveraging uh, this, this uh, racial anxiety and antipathy among some white parents um, to try to turn uh, white parents now against uh, public schools, but also, also black. So they're pushing hard for homeschooling. They're pushing for different kinds of private schools. You know, they've been very important in the reopen protests. So this is a time when also uh, our public schools and our public school teachers really need our support. Um, they, in some places, you know, they are risking huge fines and criminal liability for telling the truth about American history, you know, like that the constitution enshrined slavery, like that would be illegal, Wisconsin teachers told me for them to help their, their students understand. So another marker about that issue, if you are a teacher or a parent who's concerned about, you know, the stuff in, in your community or, um, or, or, 
anyway, if you're someone who needs these resources, there's a coalition that's been formed um, in the last, I don't know, maybe six months or something called Learn From History, uh, which I highly recommend connecting to. It involves all the major historical uh, organizations, teachers, uh, PTA, community people, et cetera. And they have resources that you can download, you know, little fact sheets and things for, for all kinds of people. But so, so that would be um, important, I think, right now in facing this latest onslaught on public education. Patrick, too. Oh, hi. Um, I just want to compliment the book you wrote because we read it in our book club and I just was so impressed and I'm so grateful to you. Um, we read Dark Money by Jane Mara afterwards and mm -hmm. Ann Nelson's Shadow Network and they seem to really go together well. Yeah. And we finished with um, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism and mm -hmm. all four seem to suggest that you know, the deck is stacked in favor of wealthy people who've captured our government. I, I just have two questions for you. One has to do with Supreme Court reform and one has to do with media reform. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court reform question I have for you is, if you read the lessons of Reconstruction and how the Supreme Court interpreted the Civil War Act amendments and the Reconstruction amendments to basically mean the op the Reconstruction Act to mean the opposite of what they meant. So the, the North won the Civil War, the Supreme Court engaged in a judicial coup and they took away the power to enforce the Civil Rights Acts and even took away the power to stop murder based on race, to stop voting in the Cruikshank case. Mm -hmm. And then we, we had to wait all those years until 37 with the threat of court packing to get mm -hmm. the court to not be thwarting the constitution and turning it on its head. Yeah. So the question I have for you is now that we're in the exact same place again, with the Supreme Court having done 10 years ago in Citizens United, something similar to what the Supreme Court did in the 1880s and 90s, and seeing that they overturned the Voting Rights Act and they cut up the Affordable Care Act. Now they've thwarted the vaccine mandate. My understanding is in May, they're gonna overturn the decision upholding the EPA authority that was necessary to allow for the massive reductions in carbon pollution, mm -hmm. the 5-4 decision that came out in 2015. And they may take away administrative agency powers largely. So why is it that we can't get a more broad scale support for the common sense idea of changing the number of justices, which we've done five times is in, is in the statute and it's purely congressional power and it's the only way to keep the court to be legitimate. And yet every time you talk about it, they wanna make it sound like you're engaged in something illegitimate. They mm -hmm. seem to have it completely backwards. It's a packed court. It's doing a judicial coup. We wanna unpack it. And that's how our constitution is designed. And Senator Warren's now in favor of it, but the, even the Obama administration and some of the key Democrats haven't figured out a way to talk in a common sense way. And my other question is about media reform. Why can't we get our airwaves back? Because we're giving mm -hmm. them to the corporations for free with no responsibility, no fairness doctrine, and then they're filling it up with big money. Yeah, well, I think you've just really eloquently uh, made the case about both. I mean, we absolutely uh, need Supreme Court reform, but it is, you know, as you know, in 1937, it was kind of a third rail too, that Roosevelt was very, very frustrated um, by uh, by the obstruction that was coming from um, this court that was, you know, committed to undermining anything that was popular essentially, um, and that would interfere with corporate power. Um, and so he said um, that he would expand the court and, you know, people say the switch in time that saved nine, you know, that one of the justices ended up changing his position, but it did um, uh, uh, redound on Roosevelt in a in a negative way, which I think a lot of people look to today. I think we're in a very different situation today, and I think this is very like um, the uh, case that Tula was making about um, uh, campaign finance reform and shining the light on corporations. I think educating people about just how captured this court is um, and the danger that can come from a captured court, as you said, you know, with the, um, uh, after the, the defeat of reconstruction, the kind of horrible uh, Supreme Court that we had all those years that allowed complete corporate freedom and also Jim Crow and uh, disenfranchisement, that's what a captured court looks like. Um, so I think uh, we have to keep pushing on that. I would say that um, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse's captured court 
a, a captured courts project would be helpful resources on that because he just shows he goes through all these decisions and you know really sums it up and makes the case and also has some good YouTube videos you know that could be uh, pressed out where he's arguing that you know he's done that in various hearings and, and such um, so I would urge that and I think it's also important for people to remember that although the Supreme Court has tremendous power that power depends on legitimacy. And we've seen again and again in US history that when the court strays too far from the population and does these things that are outrageous, you know, in the view of the citizenry, that puts tremendous spotlight on them and tremendous pressure. And we're at one of those inflection points now with this court. So I think continuing that pressure and making sure people know, you know, what they are up to is, is really important. On the question of media reform, um, yeah, I mean, we are in a situation right now that is um, devastating because there are, it's a billion, multi-billion dollar business to promote the big lie. <laughs> um, and so, you know, clearly that's the case with Fox News, with, you know, Rush Limbaugh, I don't know if you ever saw, there was, I remember a New York Times Magazine article that had a, a, a photo of his, it was a barn full of sports cars, you know, that he'd acquired through doing this phony populism on his radio uh, show. You know, again, I think though that the people, we're gonna have to show that we want all these things um, by getting out, by, you know, doing the work um, of demanding them if we wanna get that change. And I don't know if anybody uh, saw, there was a, um, a piece in, um, in the New York Times Sunday Review maybe three weeks ago or so by Corey Robin. Um, and it was about, you know, the trouble that the Biden administration is having, you know, getting through an agenda that's very popular. But um, Corey Robin, who's a political scientist, ended up saying, um, well, actually, Biden's in a very different position than Franklin Delano Roosevelt was and then uh, Lyndon Johnson was because they had huge congressional majorities. <laughs> You know, they, they, whereas his are like paper thin. And in the case of the Supreme Court now, you know, we have these two obstructionists. Um, but he, they, Corey Robin also pointed out that Biden had, I mean, um, uh, Roosevelt and LBJ had huge, empowered, active social movements demanding these things and pushing the whole political uh, system to the left and to action. And he ends up saying, you know, maybe, maybe Americans, we're not showing that we want these things enough, you know, <laughs> to get out there and do the work of making them happen. So I think, you know, that's worth considering. How do we, you know, each up our level of commitment, you know, each think about, you know, who are three more or five more people we can get involved in the work, you know, how can we, you know, make sure that we're calling our, our um, you know, radio stations, you know, with responses to things, doing op-eds, doing, you know, just all the things that begin to change the public conversation, begin to create the kind of sense of urgency that clears those log jams. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, for being with us for the beginning of the book club. Um, and I, I know we didn't get to all of the questions. There's so many great ideas um, that I hope will 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 uh, come out in the breakout rooms. Um, but any last thoughts for us, Nancy, before we go into our breakout rooms to discuss the book? Uh, well, I will just say again, I'm just so thrilled to see so many of you here and taking time uh, from, you know, I know we're all under strain with this, you know, in everyday life before the pandemic, but certainly now with the pandemic. And, you know, I'm sure there are people on this um, uh, Zoom who have lost family members whose communities have been devastated. I'm guessing we have nurses and um, public health workers of different kinds. So, um, so I'm just tremendously uh, grateful to to you all for for caring about these issues and for being engaged in the, this work and I guess I'll just say, you know, these issues can be daunting, you know, when you look at the power that the other side has and the integrated strategy. But one thing that I always try to remember when I feel that way is none of us is acting alone. You know, we are part of a much larger, sometimes I feel like it's almost a cosmic division of labor, you know, of people who really care about these issues and are working in different domains. And each of us has a contribution to make. And I think a way, you know, if we're not as active as we'd like to be, you know, one thing we can do is kind of, you know, inventory ourselves a little bit, right? Like, hmm, 
what networks are we part of? You know, you know, is my, you know, whatever there, you could be, you know, your alumni group or your coworkers or your congregation or your neighborhood or whatever, you know, we all know people that we can reach and that we can, you know, try to encourage to, to take all this seriously, to get involved. Um, and then we can think about, you know, what are our talents? You know, some people are really good at talking to people. Some people are really good at at writing letters to the editor or could get good. You know, some people are um, good at, at teaching and doing popular education. You know, some people are good at, you know, helping out in an office that needs to move stuff. So really just thinking about what we're good about and good at and also just what we're passionate about. You know, like, is there a particular way that you can plug in something you really care about and you feel like you know about, you know, that you can use to, to advance this work. And there's really, you know, there's more than enough for all of us to do, but I will also also say, uh, maybe in conclusion too, that I uh, teach the history of social movements. Um, and, you know, sometimes you look at these things and it looks so dire and it is dire, the issues are serious, but it, it, it coming into connection with other people who share your values, who share your commitments, who share your sense of humor and frustration, it is tremendously and you know energizing, and it really enables us to grow. And often it can be actually fun <laughs> to not you know be succumbing to the depression anymore, but really feel like you're in the fight. So I would uh, leave that there and um, and just thank you all again. And hope that you're continuing this conversation, you know, in, in these more manageable breakout groups. We thought it's very important for us to stay involved, be connected with each other, uh, to have support of each other, to build ourselves up. And we thought it's very important to connect the dots between a money and what's happening with these different social groups, with the, like the gun lobby and the voting lobby and who's, who's supporting these things, and to try to help that get... Uh, uh, you know, get resolved. And, uh, you know, we feel like it's very important for us to just keep being there, keep connecting, and that solutions will come up, even though we don't see them now. If we keep talking, we have some very decent, intelligent people here. And if we keep networking, solutions will come. We can't give up. And that people should be Love Tula you. and Deb from, from Group 8. We um, had an amazing group uh, from all over the country, and we felt like our main focus, that the action we need to take, that everybody is taking, is legislative action. And some of our group members were working very hard through church groups uh, for local action, as lots of them were, um, and through environmental groups. And we really felt it was important, no matter what state you were from, to keep pushing and and working, uh, especially locally and statewide, uh, for action. Also, nationally, to uh, we prioritized uh, showing up and making those phone calls and how important it was on a national level. We also talked about how you form camaraderies by any individual action that you decide from an area that's interesting to you to join with other people that it's fun and it gets us ready for the big push for the election. And we had great ideas like a corruption campaign chorus that one group's doing and, and uh, a lot of uh, environmental action. It was really fun to hear everybody's ideas on what they were doing in their different states. It was inspiring. Great. And feel free to add more actions to the chat as we talk about that. those actions. Group seven. I don't have a reporter, but is there someone from group seven? People remember their group. Janet, would you report back from group three? Oop, if you can unmute. I'd be happy to. Uh, it was very enjoyable, first of all. And um, I met some wonderful people and I'm delighted to have done so. And um, the overarching uh, theme of the conversation was that as much as we admire and respect the many, many, many uh, groups um, full of activists uh, working on issues of importance, there is so much splintering that unlike our opponents who are 
organized and um, very, uh, very um, focused on message discipline, we sometimes uh, have our energy sort of spread across such a wide variety of issues that we simply cannot take on um, the likes of, you know, ALEC or the State Policy Network. So our recommendation was that we attempt to try to create an umbrella group with organized messaging in a disciplined fashion. And anyone from my group who would like to correct or add on, I welcome them. Kate? Can you unmute for us? Can you unmute? Um, I thought I was unmuted. Thanks. Sorry about that. We had um, two people who are already writing books and researchers. So I think, you know, where Nancy talked about um, what are my talents? We had a couple of people who are already using those talents. We had somebody who was developing a talent, like realizing that public speaking was important. Got to learn how to do it, learned how to do it, and is practicing that. And then we had a very interesting um, exchange because people, um, one person said, how do I talk to my friends who are kind of complacent and comfortable and trusting nice people, but they're not they're not feeling the urgency that we I feel they should be having. And another one was talking within the Christian framework of having just being very frustrated about that. So those two people got into conversation with each other about things like braver angels and how to have the tough conversations. And that's something that a lot of us are doing. How do you deal with your Republican or right wing friends who have bought the stop the steal and so forth and so on. So um, that's a lot of what we talked about. Great. I'm going to just ask uh, Lisa to report from her group, even though you don't know your group number. <laughs> if she's still with us, go ahead and unmute Lisa. And I'm not sure which group I was in. It's okay. What it, what actions did your group decide? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure we came up with any actions. Um, there was a sense that we need to stay optimistic, um, that being pessimistic is just not going to get us anywhere. Because if we don't believe that we can make the change, then there's no point. <laughs> um, there, we talked a little bit about this concept of th that uh, our author had suggested, which is kind of getting all these various groups that are working on these all these different um issues to somehow have a cohesive message or a kind of working together more rather than all the different separate issues um i'm not maybe articulating this well but it seems like there's sometimes so many factions um within the democratic party that we're not really pulling together um and you said it's a nonpartisan group but i i'm I'm making that as an example, I guess. Um, let's see, what else did we talk about? Group, anybody wanna speak up? <laughs> I have a comment. Go ahead. I'm not sure what group I was in. Um, I see Bob Perry's on the line uh, with us, but uh, he, he more or less led the, the discussion. But, um, kind of at the end of our discussion, there was, I, I made a comment that I'd like to throw out and see what reaction there is. And that is, it would be wonderful to somehow establish relationships with two categories of organizations. One would be progressive journalists who are willing to uh, write articles about these issues and who are willing to have a, a support by citizens and the second group would be progressive law firms who are willing to look at issues and maybe initiate um, litigation on a pro bono basis in an effort to bring uh, to the public's attention some of the abuses that we're talking about. Um, I don't know how to do that, frankly, and I would love to have the advice of people in the group as to um, how, how to reach out and, and try to make that connection. Uh, but it strikes me that were that to happen, 
it might really be a very uh, effective way to cause the changes in our society that need to be occurring. Great. We have a minute left. Um, I'm going to call on Paul Levy which, to, to report from his group, even though it says Elizabeth Levy. <laughs> You're on mute. Please unmute. I think it's Paul. Paul was in Our seven. Group already, with us. Yeah. Oh, Paul your group, 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 yeah, group yeah. reported. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I know we, well, if other groups um, would like to report, we, I know we wanted to wrap up by 8.30 and we've gotten lots of book suggestions in the chat, um, but keep keep adding additional book suggestions for our book club. Um, yes, Nancy, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, our group didn't really focus on what people can do, but a few items did come up that I thought were interesting. Um, one member of our group said that they on a weekly basis, protest outside of corporate headquarters and advertise what those corporations are doing for political donations. And I thought that was a brilliant idea. And, um, and just generally raising awareness and accountability around corporate political donations. And then another gentleman in our group from Michigan uh, commented that he worked on uh, an amendment, a constitutional amendment to have um, redistricting done by a nonpartisan committee. So that's all I could think of that we had. Great. Thanks for that report. Any uh, other Olivia, report backs? Yeah, Olivia, if I may, I would like to thank the members of group one, which included Richard Routman. Uh, they also included uh, Cheryl Johnson, Diane Robertson, uh, John Mashey, or Mashey. Uh, I've mentioned uh, Richard Routman. Carol Shapira and Jean Dorsey. Um, we had a, a wonderful conversation and I thank uh, Richard for finishing his thoughts about how we move forward. I just want to throw out one more suggestion. Um, I have a radio program on KKFI, which is the Pacifica Community Radio Station. And you probably know Nancy was on uh, the last August on law and disorder, which is, it gets carried on the community radio station. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, and uh, I can help you get coverage on Pacifica radio stations. Great, great suggestion. Get the message out wider. So, well, um, Olivia, should we? Oh, I see a note from Brian about the Granny D birthday celebration. The link in the chat to that. Um, Joe, a little word from you, or my co-leader. You have to unmute just as I had to. Basically, that's it, folks. It's been a good, a good meeting, a good uh, discussion, a great book. And um, I hope you all enjoy it. And y'all come back. <laughs> yes. So we'll take all the book suggestions and we'll send out a, a little summary of tonight's with some of the chats and um, a link to the recording. Of course, the breakout conversations were not recorded, but just Nancy's talk and our final um, summary. So thank you all so much for coming and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Have what a great, a great group. group. Yeah. Thank don't forget, uh, everybody, to save the chat. That's my. Uh... That's always my song, uh, swan song. Yep, save the chat. We're saving it, but if you save it, you'll have it. Great, and I saw there's lots of different connections. So hopefully everyone will stay in touch and keep the, the robust conversations going. So thank you. Is there a way for us to stay in touch, Olivia? Do we all have each other's uh, contact information? There's or? a Google group, the yep. book group, Google group, which is where I sent the announcement today reminding you. So. Uh, feel free to use that for discussion as well. Yeah, everybody how do you, who how is do you here save is the now chat? on the list. How do you save the chat? You go down to the bottom and you look at the three little dots on the far right at the bottom. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Three yeah. little dots. You hold on that and then the top thing says save chat. Well, there's another step. So you, you click, click on, on the, the three, three dots, dots mm -hmm. and then you get... It, it says more. You have to say oh. you you get a highlighted 
blue that says save chat, you click on that, and then you will get the acknowledgement that, that the chat has been saved with Thank a check mark. I don't see that, but I, I have an iPad. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> we can you also send it out that? in the summary too. So uh, when, again, when you're all on the mailing list now, which is great. So that's where, um, where does the chat go when it's saved? Like how do I find it later? In right. documents. <laughs> Oh, it shows up in your um, in your downloads, and under okay. the downloads, there's a, a bunch of things that are called Zoom, oh and those God. are the among those are the chats from the Zooms you've been on okay, that, thank you, you. that you've saved. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. You had a question. Helpful. Yeah, I'm I'm new to this group, and I only got the invite because I got a note from uh, Nancy. I don't know who to make the suggestion to, so I'll just throw it out as my dear daddy would say, I'll run it across the collective desk and you can do with it as you see fit. I suggest, I don't know, you may have already done it, The Politics Industry by Catherine Gell and Michael Porter. I don't know if you've read, the, if you've uh, brought those books on or brought her, had her on. Great ideas. Um, I think it's a good book, but anyway, I just suggest that to you. I Great. see. I see Joe and Kate writing it down. Oh yeah, somebody suggested it to us at the last book group. But James, it sounds as though you think we could get them to come and be on the on the talk. Um, yeah, Catherine, I think you can. Catherine is on LinkedIn, and um, she's very responsive. Um, okay. I don't. I don't James, know. James, oh. I think uh, they wrote another book or two that. Some other people have mentioned. I don't know if you you know what the names of them are, but I've I've heard of this uh, duo before writing uh, helpful books. Yeah, yeah, they wrote you know another one. I just, I don't remember. I just can't remember. But the one that you mentioned was one that somebody suggested to us strongly the last time. So thank you for that because we have not chosen the next book. There it there it is. Hey, um, all the post-it notes in it too. Great okay. mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's it about? Well, listen, folks, maybe we should um, kind of end the meeting, although, well, no, never mind, Olivia, I'll let you let it run if you want. <laughs> well, I was going to end the meeting, but it seemed like people wanted to hang on yeah. and keep talking, <laughs> so we can hang on a few uh, more minutes. Yeah. Could I have the name of that book, Politics What? Industry. The Politics Industry. Industry. Okay. How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. But all you really need is the politics industry and Catherine Gell, spelled G E H L. Okay, and I want to I want to recommend this book by Timothy Snyder called On Tyranny, mm -hmm. and it has twenty lessons. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe we can all uh, figure out what if one of those lessons resonates with us. Great and idea. Snyder has a, also has a couple of other books that are uh, excellent. Uh, I'd like to rec I'd like to recommend this book. The real Anthony by uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, the real Anthony Fauci. Oh, uh, oh! <laughs> thanks, John. You're welcome. All right, thanks. Thank you all. Have a good great night, night. What a great night! Thanks, everybody.